Is that the clap? That's it. The clap, we're underway. <laughs> we're underway. <laughs> All right, there we go. Here we go. It's the April edition of Horizon. Um, but DT, things are going to get confusing for people. I'll tell you why. Because we're going out on two topics this month. Yeah, which, which is the are... same. Well, as in we normally would do two, to be fair. I know, but these are hot. Uh, okay. These are hot, man. <laughs> well, these are really hot. Okay. So we're going to be talking about AI and the danger of putting revenues ahead of controls, yep. which I think is being evidence with what's happening in the big social media companies. And uh, a week ago... I hit the headlines. <laughs> you, you did. You did. Uh, on the magnificent BBC website, in fact, you probably got a few more uh, clicks than what you might do on an article. You never know. Article that we post on our website. But anyway, yes, you were. You were named and quoted, even, um, yeah. for all your posting that you've done, possibly in vain, <laughs> to try and call out some of the issues that you see consistently. I'm not on... Facebook yeah, well, I, I don't think I don't think I mean you know, it'd be lovely one day if if we if Scardi ended up working with with the big social media companies, but that's not really what it's about. I, I think there's a much bigger um, takeaway for the finance industry, actually, for the people that we serve and the people we look after, um, with you know just the effect of the intoxication of people around the powers of AI, and whether people are just taking their eye off the ball. Um, and also, you know, just watching out for almost this kind of evangelical new paradigm about what AI will be able supposedly to do and whether people are there for, you know, one, relaxing controls, two, putting controls actually in the wrong order so that kind of business is before the control. And then the other one, which I think is something that we're going to see a lot more of, um, which is where we're going to see you know, this reliance of AI and then a, a consequence cost saving and reduction of staff um, that would be looking over stuff. So that's that's one of the topics. And then the other one is the very recent incident that seems to have happened in Asia, which we've called Rogue Delta One. And that comes on to the timing confusion <laughs> because we're recording on May 2nd. It's the April edition yeah. of uh, Horizon. But actually, um, and a shout out to Karen Hashmat at Deutsche Bank, who pointed out that we really should do a Rogue Delta One episode to go out on May the 4th. Oh. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that great thinking? May very the 4th. Good, very Perfect good. Timing. So, Perfect. yeah, okay. so thanks for that, Karen. Um, that's, a, that's a great um, idea. We'll see whether we can get it out. Uh, for May the 4th. Might even go out ahead of that. We'll see what Alexandra can do. Um, I'll do my magic. She'll work yeah, on magic. Work on magic. Sure. <clears throat> so those are the two topics. Um, and, you know, I haven't really said what Rogue Delta One is all about. Sokgen, um, it appears, have had uh, a, a bout of unauthorised trading on the Delta One desk, which was the desk where Jerome Curviel was employed, um, who very nearly blew up the bank in 2008. But this time... Um, the activity of the unauthorized activity appears to have happened in Asia. Yeah. Um, so we're going to just look at that very much from the controls perspective. And the Asian business, I think, is interesting. I'm not. We're not familiar with with Sotgen's business per se. You know, other than you know, as as having been, you know, in the market at the same time that you know trades from Sotgen have been active. And I kind of have an idea about the kind of things that go on. Um, but. You know, where I think just generally, um, you know, India providing access to India, because this was uh, around the Indian market and providing access to India, that throws up a lot of interesting points. because It's a restricted market and how people provide access to that market. So but before we dive into that, DT, let's just rewind and let's just talk about AI revenues before controls and what's been happening at Meta and Instagram. We can give a we can give a quick kind of recap, can't we? So what what, yeah. what was bothering us? Well, so um, well, it was you've been pointing this out a bit, and you've been posting about it on LinkedIn. It's whereby there are adverts put up on your feed that you would then click on a link, and that link would not be linking to where you where it claimed to be. And obviously, and quite often, sorry, not obviously, I'm trying to explain it. Um, you know, there would quite often be a picture of a Keir Starmer or someone, you know, a well-known celebrity allegedly pushing this, you know, this new crypto type thing or whatever, as ridiculous as that sounds, but actually there's a serious note behind this. So you would find that people would click on a link and it wouldn't be 
leading to a legitimate side, it would be off to a fraudulent side. And the, you know, what you've been pointing out is that your feed has been full of these things. Obviously, you are sensible and understand that they are obviously a complete waste of time. But actually, if you're a vulnerable person, it may not be so obvious to you. And obviously, the, the problem is that Meta is taking in revenue from these adverts and then not really dealing with them uh, you know, as they get reported, they're going, well, actually, you know, it looked like the, the link was, was fine when we set it up, or it, when it was set up. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's causing a massive problem. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is, it, there's a lot going on in this. And in fact, all the link stuff, we, we didn't necessarily know. It's just that we, when we first looked at this situation, we noticed a series of articles that had allegedly been written by a, a journalist um, on sort of BBC branding, and that's Jane Wakefield. Um, and we got in touch with her, and, and she, it's her work, actually, that's identified, you know, working with other partners. But, yeah. but she's pulled it all together that's worked out that there's this cloaking going on on the web links. But I think fundamentally, before you even get to all of that, and, yeah. and actually for the Scardi podcast, I think we, we will do a, a I hope we're going to get to do a podcast with Jane because I'd love to talk about what the fraudsters are up to. Yeah, the full mechanics. Because right. I'd love to sort of raise awareness about what fraudsters do and so on. But actually, for this, for us, for Horizon, I want us to talk about actually the control failures at the social media companies and why this is happening and, and why I'm worried about it and why we're worried about it. So for me, the problem is that you've got the social media companies taking advertising revenue from people, mm -hmm. posting out their adverts without any kind of in-depth review. And that's why these awful adverts are getting out there with, like you say, Keir Starmer. We had one which was a, a video between consumer champion Martin Lewis yeah, and yeah. Elon Musk um, you know, talking about some great cryptocurrency scheme, which they're never going to talk about together. And you then have a situation where it's up to the community of users to report this stuff back to the social media companies for them to review them again and go, well, actually, do you know what? These adverts don't fall outside of our community guidelines, which I find kind of staggering because you're using people like Keir Starmer in an election year. That, yeah. that must be against electoral law, surely. Um, you know, and, and you're also using... You know, people like Ken Griffin of Citadel and... and Kathy uh, Wood at Kathy, Arc. Yeah, Kathy yeah. Wood at Arc, who, you know, are desperate to share with people their kind of their latest cryptocurrency trading scheme. It It is really, really bad. And when you report them, the, the social media companies are going, there's, there's nothing wrong here, nothing to see. And I don't like the fact that even if they did at that point say, it, yeah, oh gosh, you're right, we, we, we've really dropped the ball on this one. They're using a method of control that means that there's in, in never let's call it an infection. You know, there's kind of infectious material going out there, poisoning, you know, the, and particularly the vulnerable, because you and I aren't actually going to get taken in by this stuff. It kind of irritates us, gets us annoyed. And that's the other problem with their, yeah, yeah. With their control system is you're relying on users who are going to get pretty tired of yeah, this stuff. Yeah, there'll be stuff. fatigue, won't there? There'll be people go, oh, look, I've, just, I've seen this thing once and sort of rolled my eyes. I've now seen it 10 times. You know, I did think about reporting. Or maybe I did report the first time, but I, I can't be, I'm not going to report it again. It's just, yeah, and, obviously, and... it doesn't seem to make any difference, one, if I report it. But as you're alluding to, the, the, you know, the big problem is they've taken the revenue for this already up, up front and then are relying on the community to report it back to them if, if there's an issue. So even if, as you say... They go, well, that is a problem. We'll take it down. But, you know, they've already taken the revenue in. Yeah. So, you know. And I think that's, I think that's the reason why. You know, when, when we do investigations, we look at people's motivations. Yeah. And I do think that the failure from, from the business, if we, if we talk about the business as opposed to the control functions and the auditors, and I think there's a massive failure by the control functions because I think they are enabling and allowing the business to run riot. And I think what the business is doing is the business has basically come up with a a method of dragging in as much revenue as possible. And then if it's then reported after the fact, they probably don't have to return that advertising revenue. Whereas if they cut this off at the source, if they did all the checks before the revenue came in, they'd never get the advertising revenue. Yeah. So the business don't want to do that. But no one in the control functions is looking at this and going, well, hang on a minute, look at the damage that's being created 
by you know exposing the vulnerable to what's happening and also it's not even the social media companies that are picking up the tab for this stuff no you're quite right you know it's you know it is the banks at the end of the day you know they are having to staff up departments to deal with the fact that people have been scammed and possibly quite often they would look to reimburse if they can you know that's that's a costly exercise for the banks and they're on the hook but they're going well you know it's it's strange that they're not turning around or maybe they are we don't really know to these social media companies and going well hold on a minute enough is enough you know this is you know we are fraud costs us x million billion a year and a lot of it is is pushed that from from you know down that route uh yeah there seems to be no comeback to the social media companies so i think i think that's we're pretty clear on the message to the social media companies and to, to meta from Scardi, <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the finance yeah, industry. I'm sure but quite. actually, the other message we want to get out to our listeners who are in the finance industry is, this is a wake-up call. Don't be dazzled by AI and all of the possibilities because, you know, could there be similar things happening in the finance industry? And it's particularly where retail customers and small, medium enterprises are involved that I think mistakes could really be made here you know that's that's where where you know I'm, I'm coming from on this and you and i were discussing earlier about you know what what could be some kind of examples that would make people really realize stuff so here's the kind of the theoretical to kind of show <laughs> how how we we could you know we could that how the finance industry could do something similar to the social media company so imagine if a bank gave all of its customers credit cards when you open the bank a bank account with a ten thousand pound limit, and then waited to see who gets into difficulty, and then goes back and goes, "Oh, you're in difficulty. Sorry. Um, yeah, you're quite right. Actually, you should have a thousand pound limit. Uh, but hey, do you know what? You've still got to repay us all that money. Yes, with interest. Oh, and, and by exactly. the interest charges, and you did sign up to that at the yeah, start. Yeah. So they've got all these people on the hook. They've got their revenue in now. Clearly, that would never happen because before you handed out credit cards to everybody, you'd do the Some, um, the uh, means the, testing. Yeah, you'd exactly. Check There'd be checks. What what would what would happen? So why is it that the social media companies are happy to take advertising revenue from anybody at all who's just a Facebook advertiser who's purporting to be? Hey, I'm Ken Griffin. <laughs> You know, of Citadel, yeah. but I just want to tell you. But by, by, by the way, I'm a Facebook advertiser that, that that focuses on woodwind instruments. You know, I mean, it is that absurd. Yeah, yeah. You know, people might think I'm joking. I'm not. It's that absurd. What's going on? Um, you know, it's it's really really ridiculous. So, do I think that the banks are going to start giving everyone credit cards and trying to do this kind of stuff? No, of course I don't. I do think though that there are situations in the finance industry because we're dealing with Obviously, the whole population and what people care about is their health and their money, their finances. I think there are chances that people, you know, the business will push forward things on the strength of how good AI is at Why? controlling this. Yeah, because it allows them to cut costs. It allows them to, to de-staff, as it were. They can put in, you know, a, a program, whatever it may be, that will do the, the work of x number of people you know there's a massive incentive for them to look at that but obviously as you say if there's if there's a problem with that uh that that's that's, that's huge for them you know they can't and, and you know they are regulated businesses at the end of the day i mean yeah. i'm not saying that the, the uh, social media companies aren't but they have a different sort of regulation that, that, that sits above them yeah and and they are using their users um as collateral as they're, as they're, or yeah. they're accepting collateral well, and as their policemen as well really yeah yeah so there we go. So that's enough on, on that one. Now, May the 2nd, May the 4th, <laughs> Rogue Delta 1. So, DT, what has been happening in Asia? Have you got a, have a quick summary? Well, quick. You've, uh, you've been a bit more over this, but I mean, I would say that uh, I think it was about a year ago to the day we released uh, something about road trading, talking about Jerome Kerbio, who'd been at Sokjian, and uh, Nick Leeson at Behrens, et cetera. Um, and the issue seems to be at Sokgen, and it is a sort of breaking story. There's been a, a, a well, not well, something, an article by Bloomberg, and then actually, interestingly, the trader has reached out via LinkedIn and posted what has gone on on his side of, or he claims has gone on his side of things. And there, Bloomberg have then re, you know republished or published a second story that covers it. But it's all to do with the Delta One desk, which. <clears throat> 
uh, as I'm sure people are aware from from our side of things, you know, you it is looking to be a hedge product. So you know, you're selling or buying a, a structured product and then hedging it out yourself and hopefully taking some margin between. And and you are a you know, these desks can take a certain amount of risk, but there's supposed to be some very heavy parameters around what they're allowed to do, especially at a place like SockGen, which has seen a massive blow up issue on this very desk before, not in Asia, obviously, but out in uh, but, but uh, uh, in France. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, you, you, your expertise is more on the sort of Indian side of things. And this is where it looks like some of this has been occurring out of the Hong Kong office, but, but trading products into India, which, as you alluded to at the beginning of, of the chat, is a sort of controlled market. So it's, it's not available to everyone. So there tend to be structured type products that are sold on to people that would allow them to get exposure to, to that market. But yeah. what, what, what's, what's been happening from a sort of, it looks like there's been a lot of stuff in, in options uh, and, uh, you know, quite short dated, etc. So you... Yeah, I mean, we can really get into the weeds on this stuff. But fundamentally, what appears to have happened is you have a trader that has been booking positions and then they haven't, for whatever reason, been hitting the risk systems. Um, and then they've been uncovered at a later point. Something's happened mm. that has alerted the risk function and they've determined that these are unauthorized trades. Yeah. What has concerned... Uh, risk management at SOCGEM from what we can read. And, and the, at the end of the day, we, we are talking from outside of the firm. We don't have first-hand exposure to what's happened. You know, we're absolutely using our own knowledge and experience to kind of try and, you know, interpret what we think may have occurred. Yeah. You know, we've used some of these products. We've kind of seen, seen how, how things play out. Um, but it, it, it seems that the concern is around the fact that um, transactions were, or, or trades were, were set up that would have um, left the bank very exposed to a spike in volatility, an increase in volatility, and also correction in markets. So it yeah. sounds like there's been the selling of, of puts, yeah. effectively. Yeah. I don't think there's anything more scientific than that. Maybe it is more scientific than that. Um, and I think it's a really, again, it's an interesting situation in that the trader has it seems been able to put in a year of profitability before um, his actions were uncovered. And again, it's the, the situation where you have a trader, a bit, bit like, uh, you know, you see with other, other um, unauthorized trading events, people always turning around and pointing the finger at the organization yep. and saying, look, you know, people knew what I was up to. They knew what I was doing. Mm. You know why are they suddenly saying this is all unauthorized? This was this was done in the in the line of sight of of everybody, um, and it's very interesting reading the, the gentleman's kind of counter to what he sees has you know has occurred. Um, so if we look at you know what what is what is going on here? So Delta One, as as we've said, it's you know the clues in the name Delta One. You know it really should be putting out pretty linear exposures for people to trade into markets. India is a great market for the banks because it's difficult for people to access. Um, you know, there are exchange restrictions. It's, it's historically had a restricted currency, had a restricted market. You've got instruments like foreign currency convertible bonds, FCCBs, enabling um, Indian companies to raise finances from overseas investors. You've got global depository receipts historically that have been around to again allow people to invest in, in the shares uh, from overseas. Um, and then a, a, a product that I was using uh, to hedge my convertible bond book, my FCCB book when I was in Asia, and this is obviously 16 years ago, um, is the P note, mm. the participation note, which again, you're taking advantage um, in India of you know, some of the really great local um, products like single stock futures. Um, there's also, you know, indices and options on the Nifty as well. And you can therefore put together, um, you know, a portfolio of convertible bonds, hedge those with P notes that cover the single names if you've actually got names that replicate your positions. Or you could use a bit of an index hedge as well. Um, that all sounds great. And, it, and from an audit perspective, it all sounds so wonderful in, in terms of you're just 
you know, putting on an exposure, you're backing it out to the customer, and it should all be very, very straightforward. The reality is, with this stuff, you're bringing in all kinds of um, risks that aren't necessarily um, obvious. Or captured by some of the systems. Well, because that's even worse. Yeah. But you're, you're right. But actually, you'd, you'd hope that they were. But it may not be obvious once positions start to move yeah. that you're rebalancing stuff. And also, you know, if your controls are lax around this stuff as well, and again, if this is a business that's been growing up in recent years and people are kind of running before they can walk in terms of, you know, we just got to get this stuff booked, um, then you may find that, you know, people haven't recognized, you know, one, cross-currency exposures. You know, if you're dealing with local futures, lo local stocks, um, and then you've got P notes that could be traded in out of currency dollars to hedge people's FCCB positions, for example. Yep. And you'd like to think that there was some kind of India NDF position, Indian rupee ND NDF position taken, or some other kind of local um, currency exposure taken as well. But people may not recognize that. Um, so there's that you may have different funding positions, because people may not recognize the the funding of the futures position versus the p-note position and i think what's also probably worrying for this situation is it seems that like this chap was booking out pretty short dated trades and it certainly seems that they're only getting booked out at expiry date mm. um and that um uh, is a situation where i i wonder whether he understood the risks he was running. So I think he, he identified he had a very profitable strategy yep. in terms of selling options, taking in premium. Interest rates have gone up nicely. So you're getting credited a lot of funding on that long cash position. And the P notes are there to book the economics of a transaction, the cash flows, but not necessarily replicate the risks because they're a Delta One product. Mm. And of course, options aren't a Delta One product at all. There's all kinds of, of Greeks in there and exposures. And that's where I think the problem is. I think that, and, and I'm, it's all me surmising, mm. but I wonder whether, again, and it goes back to this point, Damien, where if you've got someone who's come into trading after the crisis and only seen a very low interest rate environment where everything's stable, volatility doesn't really move much, they aren't exposed to the same kind of experiences that we had where, you know, we've been through the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, 9-11, you know, and on global financial GFC, crisis yeah. where, you know, volatilities have been all over the place. Rates have been all over the place. You suddenly become much more aware of the risks that you're running. I, I certainly didn't have a, a stable period in my career spanning you know, 12 years where rates didn't move. But that's what all these guys had. Yeah, you know? and, and you're, you know, if you think about a lot of the risk systems that are run, they're obviously there's scenario analysis within them, but they haven't seen any of the volatility. So in fact, you know, you, you kind of go, well, actually, worst case, X could happen or Y. But the, you haven't seen it in the real world for such a long time that you, you haven't seen that P&L swing around like you would. And that seems to be the case here where they've uncovered trades that, they seem to then have obviously closed out, but they were exposed, massively exposed to any any jump involved, which would have been very detrimental. And it's interesting. So, so he, the, the trader in question, in his kind of rebuttal, was pointed to, you know, he he thinks that these products were inside of his trader mandate. Again, I I think that's an interesting situation because I I wonder whether P notes on options at Sockgen have been through a new product approval. Are they actually? There or is this a situation where you've got a product that's backing up to an exchange traded product with a local regulator that's going to come down on you like a ton of bricks if you don't get your positions sorted? So you've got an operational setup where the staff are doing what they can in a growing and potentially high volume business because you've got more issuance of product out in, in the market um, 
where they're seeking to resolve problems as quick as they can. And that's probably all that the, the room that they have without looking beyond the problem to actually challenge the causes of a problem. Am I making myself clear? That? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. But you, you see what I'm saying? And it may well be the case that actually it hasn't been through MPA or even refused MPA because someone identified that, it, you know, the economics of a peanut don't match the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the trading risks of, you know, derivatives um, and options on this stuff. So that's an interesting situation. Plus also, you know, Delta One, it's all about customer. It's about providing access for customers. When you read what he's doing, it sounds like he's been taking positions for the house. And again, is that in line with his mandate? You know, house versus client. What has been happening um, in, you know, specifically on the desk? And I think also, you know, in fairness to him, um, and I do have a little bit of sympathy for him, in that I have been someone who's been through the whole kind of trader apprenticeship style structure that traders learn in. You know, he, he's calling for a rule book, which I think is a big ask because yeah. I, I think, you know, obviously trading is a skill and you are dealing with, you know, you have advisors around you, like, you know, second line compliance advisory to help you. You know, you have your senior managers who should be helping you and advising you. It seems to me that this is a chap that's enjoyed success and therefore he hasn't actually had people over him asking him or getting him to justify how he's making his money um, and making sure that he understands the risks that he's taking. And that's a real risk, I think, in you know, juniorization of, of desks. Um, I think there's a, a risk with that juniorization that you, you know, when you're relying on this apprenticeship structure, do you have people with a, enough knowledge around to be supporting the people that are on, on the desk? Or actually, has there been a lot of knowledge lost um, around the product where it means that people are kind of, you know, it's almost like the blind leading the blind and you're setting things up in, in quite a, a bad fashion. We're definitely, as you keep you know, pointing out, we're in a higher for longer environment now. Yeah. We're not going back to that old paradigm, you, you think, of ultra low rates forever. You know that isn't going to happen. No, I oh, know absolutely, and well, and actually, I think <clears throat> Jerome Powell yesterday, uh, and well, yesterday, the day before, during the Fed meeting, was admitted as much as well. Really, you know, the expectation is that there will hopefully, from from a lot of people's point of view, be a rate cut, but that will be it <laughs> at the moment. I think as we've been pricing in six, and I think we're now down to one. So yes, there, there's a definite. Um, realization in the market that we are higher for longer and and i think you know the upper bound having been two percent for a long time or the target it feels like we'll probably end up being reset to sort of three percent and you know the, i think fed will attempt to get inflation down to that sort of level but you i don't think we'll go anywhere near that i think that was definitely anomaly that we saw from yeah. the, in that sort of 10 15 year period so again you're in a situation where you know the environment's going to be difficult going ahead um obviously the good news is traders are going to get up the curve and be, you know, acquiring knowledge because they, they have to. Um, you can see how in, you know, looking back at last year, if this, is, this guy was making money and you've got other things happening in an Asian business like, you know, China real estate, uh, real estate crisis, hmm. you know, stress in bonds, you know, high yield bonds coming under pressure, probably desks struggling to make revenue. And here's someone making revenue. Are people going to be quick to challenge and interrogate how that P&L is being made? They should have been, but you can understand why they may not have been. Um, so I think that, you know, that's sort of some of the, 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 the takeaways for the control functions around this stuff. And I would, sorry, just to butt in, and also yeah. I would, would bring up, I'm pretty sure it's this month that we moved to T1 in the US. There's been talk in India actually of trying to move to T0, I mean, given, you know, it does throw up th that classic issue whereby you are, you know, th th that squeezing of the um, settlement window is just going to cause more and more problems. So if it's still not sorted now, I mean, options, I assume in India will probably be T1 currently, um, correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, if you're going, if you're, lo you, well, there's a big lowering in the States about to happen, uh, possible push to T0 in India. I mean, this is, you know, you can imagine the carnage that this could start to cause, you know, that you've got, you've got. As I, and I'm, it's probably the case here. You know, you've got 
you've got different hubs. So you've got Asia, you've got India, you know, similar time zone, and then you've got Europe. So it's it's getting risk positions back to the central hub. Quite often, you know, these risk overall risk will be sat in, in one jurisdiction. Yeah. You know, if you've moved, if you've knocked a day off that settlement, which is knocking the window, the whatever, 11 hour, they've worked out trading window down to about two hours to actually get these things settled. You know, there's going to be a massive rush to get things booked in systems. I mean, we'd all love to think that all these banks have these high proficient systems, but they don't all talk to each other. There's, there can be quite a lot of manual duplication. So if you've got that 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 loss of day, that, that could be a, another big knock on effect that we're going to see real issues. I, I think you're right. And and I think what people should appreciate as well with, you know, this kind of business where you're dealing with, you know, one SEBI ID that you're backing out to all of your customer business, you're going to inevitably end up with pools of co-mingling positions. So it's hard to identify what's happening. Yeah, It's easier for traders either through lack of knowledge, lack of experience or willful behavior to take, you know, peripheral risks around their book that aren't recognized. So, you know, funding positions, take a massive flyer in funding because this is a great time to take a flyer in funding. Rates are high could really generate some extra capital you know extra cash for your books well actually we sort of had we joked about it before beforehand but if you look back at nick leeson at bearings you know he was in a big hole and he was just starting to sell options like fury just to try and bring in this is not really a funding but this is just to try and bring bring some dollars in well, or some a margin yeah, yeah. situation yeah, yeah. you know again to, to but it's 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 all a, you know all right it's different you know different meat different gravy and all that kind of stuff but it, it's all part of the same stuff uh dt you're absolutely right and, you know, it's not just um, in funding, it's in currency as well. And you also have a, a situation where when you've got these big pools of where you're, you know, you're commingling stuff between the house and between the customers. If you look back at what happened with Curviel back in 2008, and this is the, the sort of the really interesting part of this story i think which more probably will play out but it seems to me that that you know he was um undertaking activity around month end similar to this chat you know booking out trades um because he was aware of the fact that certain um reconciliations were only done at month end yep. at sochen um for example and so I kind of wonder whether the remedial work that was done, you know, in light of Curviel focused very much on France mm. and Europe, because that's by far the biggest part of Sotgen's business. You know, Asia is about 12% of Sotgen's business, right? I think you looked at this, didn't you, before? Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. Comparing with... Um, uh, I think it's like 65, 70 in Europe. Exactly. Or something. I mean, it's it's really outside. It's kind of like when I was back at Lehman and, and how big Lehman was in, in the US versus um, how big Lehman was in Asia. Whereas other places I've worked, they've had a much, much more balanced global oh, picture. And Sokgen is definitely a home player, home yeah, strength. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, if you've got a business that, you know, I, I don't even know if they had a Delta One business back in 2008 when Jerome Curviel was active in, in Asia, in Asia, in yeah. Asia. Um, you know, certainly I was out in Asia and I, I can remember they had a proprietary desk. Um, that's for sure. We serviced them. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering whether actually a lot of the controls that were put in place focused on Europe and didn't really think too much about the rest of the world. Certainly it looks like they could do with a refresh around the globe yeah. and maybe others could in light of, of what's happened. And I think your point about, you know, the, the shortening of settlement cycles. This should really be a wake up call to people about, you know, some of the possibilities and some of the pockets of settlement risk that exist that people may yet to have uh, identified and, and scrutinized. And that's something that people um, should really be um, be thinking about. Well, especially if risk is managed just from one location. Yeah. Obviously, risk is, is run out of satellite offices all over the place, but quite often there will be a centralized place. It's like, okay, what is what is our position? What is the position? You know, our, all our traders across the globe, and obviously, if you've got set, shortened settlement risk, short, shortened settlement times, timings, um, you know, that's getting that information 
dumped back into one place, it's going to be nigh on impossible, really, you'd think. So uh, it would be interesting to see how that pans out. I'm sure people have been all over this, you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, we know that DTC has been conducting a lot of testing and I'm sure all the big banks have been all over this. But, you know, maybe some of their clients haven't. You know, we touched on this before. So it'll be, yeah, uh, interesting to see. I th it happens, I'm pretty sure, towards the end of this month and I think there is there's there's three days or so where there'll be both T1 and T2 settlement just to try and make sure that any hiccups get ironed out. But mm -hmm. there will be, yeah, system knock-on effects that I'm sure we, we will see play out. And, and a sort of, an, I guess another note I would add to this is control, control staff should be asking themselves, are we looking at a situation here where you've got a trader that's naive, inexperienced, someone doing something deliberate and wrong or have you got someone who's actually staying within the parameters of the controls of, of the bank and the risk limit and the structure but who's recognizing that there are opportunistic arbitrages they can do against the bank yeah. to benefit themselves as well and that's a really interesting question. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out from a litigation perspective. Um, if that if it goes, if it proceeds that way, I think it's really interesting that he's chosen to speak out. Uh, I can't believe that any lawyer has said, that's a really good idea. <laughs> yeah. Put something, put something in the public domain on this. Maybe they have, maybe he's had advice. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly sort of, I think it's going to be an interesting um, one to watch. Um, other point too about your time zone stuff, DT, is India is on a, a half hour difference <laughs> from everywhere, right. isn't it? It is, yeah. Which just adds to the complications on uh, risk systems, I, I imagine, <laughs> as well, when you're compiling um, all of this stuff. So there you go. Um, so certainly lots to, to get into from this month's Horizon Unpacked. Um, you know, Delta One. Delta One. Are people missing a trick? I think Delta One businesses are far more complicated than people realise in the control functions. Yeah. And as I say, it's it's the peripheral risks that can be taken. It's the massive amount of volumes, client volumes. You know, when you look back at, you know, we, we did Road Trader Stew, which is now you know, 12 years old, but it was putting together all of the ingredients of the Nick Leeson situation Queco Adeboli and Jerome Curviad and looking for the commonalities there. And the commonalities are all the same. You know, they don't really change. Business in transition, um, liquid instruments, um, you know, lack of management oversight, um, where you have lack of operational challenge. All of these things are similar, you know, and then we also were talking about knowing your cutoffs. You know, and this seems to have been a feature of, of this uh, of this particular incident too. So um, as Damien said, just over a year ago, we did a refresher for everyone on road trading. We did three episodes because we felt it had been kind of a long time <laughs> yes, I think we were... since anyone had done one. Yeah. So, oh, maybe we should maybe do one. Maybe there's a but chance. I think that's good, some, a free option. <laughs> it was a bit of a free option, but you never would have put money on it happening at one of those three <laughs> no, houses. That's true. That's you? true. You've got good odds on that, I reckon. <laughs> There you go. Well, that's uh, probably it for um, the May the 4th uh, Be With You edition of um, Horizon Unpacked. But of course, this is the April Horizon Unpacked. Um, if you enjoy Horizon, and we are trying to drive people more to the podcast because we think you need to listen to us. <laughs> We'd love to engage with you. Um, you can find the materials that we use for Horizon, but also all of our other uh, podcast topics in the SCADI Discord, and that's our chat community. You can become a friend of the firm, a friend of the show. Friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look out for that, and um, you know, do join uh, the SCADI Discord um, to chat with members of the team um, and uh, anyone else that's interested in uh, the controls around finance. Thanks very much for listening. We'll see you in uh, in a few months. Yeah, absolutely. A few weeks. A few weeks. <laughs> a few weeks. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you.